Hey, good morning and welcome to Breakthrough Walls. I'm Ken Walls and I'm your host and I have a special guest on today all the way from Dallas, Texas. Um, new friend of mine. I'm, I, I don't know this guy's story very well, but I think we're going to find out here in a and a few what he is all about and, and what kind of trials and tribulations he's faced. Um, so I want to thank Lisa Patrick for the introduction, by the way. She introduced us. But I'd like to welcome my new friend, Evan Stewart, to the show. Evan, welcome to the show. Ken, thank you for having me. I'm really glad to be here this morning. <laughs> Dude, I love your hat. Is that obsessed? Absolutely. Love I got it. a rep, you know? <laughs> love it. Love it. Now, who's, whose hat is that? Oh, this was mine, but we've got oh. others. I'll, I'll have to send you one when we're done. <laughs> I love that hat, dude. I, I, oh, yeah. I'm pretty obsessed myself, so, mm -hmm. so I like Absolutely. that. I like that. So, Evan, you know, as I told you before the show started, um, you know, I created this show, I don't know, a year and a half ago maybe, um, and, and it, it was literally to give back, to help people have a breakthrough in life. And um, so I want to mm -hmm. kind of just start there and, and you know, let's let's talk about your um, story, like where you were, where were you born and raised? Mm. Absolutely. Well, I'm, I'm a Dallas boy myself. So I was born in Dallas. My family's been in Dallas for generations. And my family, actually, if you go back far enough, came to Dallas on a covered wagon. Whoa. Here. <laughs> pretty much all my life and um you know my uh, my folks still live in the dallas area they're in a suburb my wife and i live downtown and it's a really really great spot you know few people know this but dallas is actually one of the best cities really in the united states for entrepreneurial opportunity we have uh, specifically a really relatively all different types of industries all different types of people from different walks of life and so um, you know, when I was growing up, I thought, man, I'd always want to move and go to Manhattan or something like that. And then when I started running business here, we have, you know, business friendly taxes and lots of opportunity. I thought, you know what? It's a pretty good spot. I think I'll stay put. So <laughs> Nice. Dallas is yeah. Dallas is awesome. As I as I told you before, I, you know, I was down there. I don't know. Maybe I can't remember. I need to look that up. But about a year ago, I think. Sure, um, visiting sure. with the Ziegler family and some other people down there. And, um, mm -hmm. man, I, I called my wife. I'm like, geez, we should move to Dallas. This place is hopping. Oh, yeah. It is really hopping. And it's central to everything, too. I mean, you can yeah. get all the way across the United States within just a short plane flight, and, and you can get it around the world with the airport that's only 30 minutes away. So it's yeah. it's a really, really good spot. I'm, I'm, I'm happy here. Now, do people down there consider Fort Worth part of Dallas? <laughs> no, no. So when you think of Texas and you think of like people driving the really big trucks and having cattle back home and stuff, that's actually Fort Worth. So Dallas is like the Manhattan of the South. It's very urban. It's very trendy. Uh, it's very, you know, just not what you think of when you think of Texas. But you go down to Fort Worth and and man, it's a different world. So the the Dallas and Fort Worth are not the same. In fact, they're about 45 minutes apart from each other. Oh. Um, so they're actually not as close as people as people think. Well, the the whole DFW thing probably throws people off. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. So so what was it like for you growing up? I mean, so you went to school in Dallas, high high school, grade school, all that. So well, my folks moved further north into the suburbs. So I was in school, not in Dallas ISD, but in uh, in the suburbs further north. And you know, growing up, it was it was it was good. I mean, my family is 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 blessed to be together. So I didn't have family disruption like some other people. But um, the line of entrepreneurs in my family goes back for generations. And so some of the earliest mentors that I have in my life would be my father and my great uncle. Okay, and when I was growing up, whenever I wanted to do something, there was this anatomy of thinking big, but then also the realistic steps to get to that big goal. Right. And so I've always been entrepreneurial. It was always, what business do I start? What service do I provide in order to earn an income or leave an impact? It was never, I'm going to go and work for someone else. So I've only had one 
real job, which was about three months of retail in high school, wow. or maybe four months, you know, something like that. That uh, it, you know, it it just didn't. I, I couldn't. I couldn't do it. I got stuck in that can, and then after a while, I thought, I just can't. This environment is not really for me. So, um, you know, growing up, life was good. I was encouraged and I was challenged. And, um, you know, I, I, I've gone through a lot of really significant ups and downs. It wasn't just all hunky dory the whole time. But, right, right. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, uh, I, there were a lot of opportunities that I was able to take advantage of due to the fact that I had some early mentors in my life that were able to lead me in the right direction right. as opposed to really having to completely figure things out just like dropped in uh that didn't happen until i was older <laughs> so so yeah well you're so your your father it sounds like and and uncle you said kind of sounds like you were kind of born with or raised with the entrepreneurial thing yes i was yeah. my my great uncle was extremely successful and he had a lake house and some land on on this big lake down in the Texas area called Lake Travis. Okay. I've massive, massive, massive lake. Yeah. And um, so we would go down there uh, as a family in the summer times. And I remember we would be, you know, I mean, we were just kids, my, my brother and I, and, and this was even before my, my baby sister was born. Um, but we would be, you know, like playing poker down at the lake house on a Friday night. And he would be talking about, we, we'd be talking about problems and how we can solve things. And we, instead of just, you know, silly kind of, BSC type conversation. It was okay. We talk about a problem. Well, how could you do? You know, who could help you solve that problem? What What is this? You know, you we would start that line of thinking, and then that was carried back home as well because that's how my father and my mother think. And so these conversations would start and get so so deep that over in obedience and a diligence of years of having these types of conversations as a child, the mindset was really developed for me was okay, now I'm, I'm really identifying solutions and implementing solutions and trying to find ways where we can better impact and improve the life of other people. I didn't have it defined as that at that time, but I a concept I have called threads of consistency. And this concept is when you're trying to identify your giftedness, how you go back in your life and you can find moments where you touch your gift, whether or not you've identified it. And so I believe that my gift is helping other people identify theirs, of living a life <clears throat> that's built around a person's strengths instead of defaulting to their weaknesses. And even as a child, it was impacting, improving, inspiring the lives of other people in that same way. And it really started with those conversations. I just didn't have it articulated in the same way as, as I do now that I've developed that, that framework and the anatomy of that statement. Dude, that is awesome, man. Wow. So you, you I mean, you seem like you're fairly young still. <laughs> yeah, I'm still in my 20s. So are you uh, really? I, I am. Yeah, wow. I say I, I say I was born as fast as I could, you know. <laughs> but um, you know, it. I got started really young. My great uncle, we called him uh, Uncle Vovo, was what we called him because his real name was Oscar Void Bennett Jr. the Third. And I was a child and I could not say that, so yeah, we called him Uncle Vovo. Yeah, and and he used to say wake up in the morning his statement for success was get up every morning and just run like hell and so, so from an early age it's just i used to tell my mom get up and run like hell and she did not like that but <laughs> <laughs> i'll bet she didn't i'll bet she no, didn't. no. <laughs> so so how how old were you then uh, now did you go to college i did but i dropped out okay so i went to college or, um, I remember I was eight days into my first semester and I would talk to my parents and I was like, guys, I don't think this is, I don't think this is for me. I, I was eight days in, uh, wow. but I stuck it out for the first, uh, I got in the first semester. I had a perfect GPA. I really, really, you know, went for it. And then I just, I just didn't care anymore. So I was there. Technically I was in school for four semesters. I was there physically for about two semesters and three weeks of the third semester. And, um, I got into real estate over the first and second semester. So I actually was simultaneously working at that time just as an agent kind of starting things while I was in school. And then I eventually transitioned over. Wow. So, <clears throat> so how old were you then, I guess, when you had your first real business where you were working for just yourself? Mm. Well, the first business, I mean, I had a couple of businesses that were, had little spurts of success. Um, when I was in middle school, I had a lawn mowing business 
And that actually, it ended up working out great. I, I, I didn't think of this at the time of the structure, but I would get all these different clients and then I would pay other people to go and mow the lawn. So let's say um, the job was, I don't know, 50 bucks. I would say, I'll give you 30 bucks to go and mow the lawn. So I'd keep 20. So I would literally broker the deals, but where my folks were living, we had large lots. And so my family had a riding mower. So I would pay my dad a little bit of use for the mower for the depreciation and the cost of use. Yeah. And then I, at one time I had four different neighbors that were all in a row. So I would ride the mower all the way across and all the way back and, and do it. Oh I remember gosh. one morning I was there so early that um, when the neighbor actually opened her door to answer the door to pay me, because I had got, I, I think it was done by like seven or seven thirty in the morning. I mean, I was at it. Wow. Uh, her alarm actually went off when she opened the door. You know? Wow. Uh, that, wow. That started making me, and that, that was, you know, about a summer, summer and a half, made a couple thousand bucks, you know, as a kid, yeah. life was good. But the real one was when I was in high school, I started a technology resale business. And, um, at the time it was, you know, just Apple with all of their new gizmos and everything. And uh, I had a friend whose father worked actually in Apple as a refurb specialist. And you can't do this anymore, but you used to be able to buy these crates of broken, needing to be refurbished technology. I say a crate, it's like a cardboard box filled with, you know, 5, 10, 15, 20, 30 of something, whether it be computers or iPhones or, iPod or iPods or anything like that. So what we would do is we would buy this crate and then we would pay my friend's father to refurb, and then we would sell the refurbished as uh, uh, refurbed technology pieces. So someone could buy for less than they could buy official Apple refurb, and then we, we you could buy an entire crate for like one, two, three hundred bucks. And wow. then we would go and we would sell one for two hundred bucks. But then Apple refurb was still three hundred, and full retail was five hundred. So we were making like thousand percent profit on these crates. And so when I was in high school, that really kicked off. I had eight people working for me. Uh, one of them was actually, I had I had um, the principal at the high school and my science teacher at the time were actually working for me. In fact, my science teacher said that she was making more selling my product than she was being a school teacher for the, the time while we were doing that. Oh and, my um, gosh, are you kidding me? And I'm, I'm serious. And this is before the days where you could just take a credit card on your phone, right? So everything was in cash. So I would come home with these stacks of cash my dad actually asked me if I was dealing drugs at one point. And I was like, I was like no, it's, it's just business. And I was walking through my bottle and he thought, wow, this is, this is great. But I would come home with these like rolls of like mobster level, you um, know, cash and just throw it on the counter. <laughs> oh my gosh. What, and this is in what grade? This is high school. So this is really, uh, well, at eight through, so partially middle school, but really eight through about 10th, 10th and a half grade um, in high school. Dude, that's that's incredible. By the way, I'm getting messages. I, I don't know what's going on with Facebook right now, um, but it says we're live, but there's an error. It won't load up. Like I'm getting message, instant <laughs> messages from people. So I'll have to, hopefully this thing's recording oh, for shoot. me and, and I can repost it. So um, my apologies to anybody trying to watch us live. Well, I can't apologize for Facebook. I, I think everything's fine on my end, but uh, yeah, wow, that stinks. But that's all right. Hey, they can watch the replay when I when I post it. So um, that's right. That's right. So, um, dude, you started young as an entrepreneur. I, I mean, you started young, young, young. I, yeah. I did. I did. Wow. You know, the video that I put out a couple of days ago with threads of consistency, I was talking about um, the story that I had brought up was when I was in kindergarten and my I had started an anti-bullying business, which was where I saw these kids would get bullied and they would pay me in gushers. Right. So they were like fruit snacks. Yeah. So you would pack the gushers. And I would give the bully two packs of gushers and keep them for myself. And he would get gushers and then he wouldn't bully you. So, I mean, I, I kind of um, joke. I said, nowadays, it sort of sounds like the mafia. I wasn't, you know, like kindergarten mafia. But um, <laughs> but in reality, what it was, in my opinion, was just like brokering peace. And yeah. so that tendency of being entrepreneurial, of, of brokering opportunity, of finding solutions, that's been in my DNA ever since I was very, 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 very young. That is absolutely awesome, man. So So that's really incredible. So you, you come out of high school, a multimillionaire. 
not quite. I'm kidding. Yeah. I'm kidding. <laughs> But you so so you you made some money. It sounds like you did pretty well, and and yeah, then yeah. Um, so you're like so you're in real estate. You're 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 just like you've spent your entire life so far brokering brokering deals. <laughs> pretty much. Wow. Pretty much. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So that's incredible. So let me let me ask. And by the way, if this whole thing doesn't record or whatever, I, I, I'm just going to ask you: Are you willing to do this again? <laughs> yes, absolutely. I don't know what's absolutely. going on, man. I have no idea. I've tried pulling this up on my phone; it will not open. So, oh really? Yeah, <laughs> oh, it's, no. it says error loading. So hopefully my software is recording and we can we can put this up and and yeah uh, hopefully yeah. so but um because this is a great story so you're you're um so you come out of high school and 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 go to college for one year um kind of yeah, one year actually physically present <laughs> right right Two years on record right yeah. so so what did you do from I mean, so you drop out of college. What was the next step for you? What'd you do from there? Um, I figured it out. Uh, it was so I, I had my real estate license at the time, and I say I got two things out of school. I got into real estate, and I found my wife. And and those are both you know my life now has changed drastically due to those two interactions. But yeah, um, I, I had my real estate license, and I was working, and I was working, and I was working, and I had I just thought you know you can always go back. You know, we're becoming that the most overeducated and underskilled movement in the history of our nation. And I had looked at everyone. You see, I looked at the people that did the traditional route, and I had noticed. I thought to myself, they're not living lives that I want, and I want to try and go for it. My first principle, which I articulate now, but at the time I had ingrained, but I hadn't brought it to a point of actual verbalization, is commit first, figure it out later. Yeah. And I was looking at my life, and I thought. I can run hard now. At the time, I wasn't married. I had a little bit of money in the bank. I had all the time in the world. You know, I'm not, I've actually, I've never been drunk. I've never been high. I've never really partied. It's always been work. So I thought, okay, everyone else is screwing off. Everyone else is going to school. Everyone else is doing this. If I want the life that everyone else wanted, I would do that. But I saw, I wanted, so, it was so different. The only thought in my mind was my path has to be fundamentally different. Yeah. And so I left and I, um, <laughs> I just started figuring it out. My first year in real estate, I sold like $300,000 worth of inventory, which ended up netting a couple thousand bucks. I mean, I, I literally almost exited. I thought, this is terrible. You know, 85 to 90% of real estate agents will, will start and quit within the first two years of the business. Wow. Because it's a hard business. Yeah. And, um, I, I was with people that didn't have the same level of work ethic and I didn't understand the business and, and it was a really hard, it was a hard start. And I remember, um, you know, there were some significant ups and downs. I had, I had worked, 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 cut my head down for about a year and a half and started building something. And a couple of deals came to fruition, big portfolios where at the time it was a big number, but we were on, on track, uh, me and a couple of business partners to close about $8 million worth of business that month. Wow. And, um, yeah. and at the time, you know, it was like a huge number. Right. And, yeah. uh, and then I remember I, I was still living in a crappy apartment. Uh, I, I just, life was not great, but it, it was part of the work. And, um, I remember right before things were about to close, the people that I was with, it was, Oh, we're firing you from the board. We are, um, we're firing you from the company, we, the company that really I, I worked to start that was built off my back. We are, uh, we're willing to keep you on as an agent if you have a split 70-30 in our favor and <laughs> if you sign a 10 year contract where in 10 years we'll allow you to be one of the first people to buy a franchise when we franchise your business model. And um, so Jeez. obviously that didn't go out over very well. Well, we had things happened and, and, and I, I left. So I remember breaking down in my crappy freaking nasty apartment the the i say the couch that i had i actually pulled from somebody had put this couch next to the dumpster for trash pickup and i had moved it into my apartment so i could have a couch in the apartment wow. i didn't even have a bed it was a futon that my back hurt on that i had to have those foam pads on i mean it was not it was not okay wow. and um, i remember thinking you know that this this I, I went from this opportunity of you know at potential to earn 
you know, uh, whatever, well, at least six figures on this deal to, well, now I'm stuck figuring it out with a couple thousand dollars in the bank. And, wow. um, and, and so that was a year and a half or so after I officially left, but I had these big moments of fluctuation where I really needed to just figure that out. And, um, different points in my life where we have these big swings between opportunity and failure. And I think that failure is important. I don't really believe in failure. I believe in feedback. And I think that those moments are just really high intensity learning opportunities and experiences. And so um, when I say I just kind of figured it out, it was more so I hit a wall and I know that that wall exists. And I also know that there is an opportunity around it. So now it's trying and trying and trying and moving around and moving around it. And I've just done that consistently over the last seven and a half years. And, um, you know, with a cross between hard work and, and God's <laughs> intervention, you know, uh, we're, we're here now. So it's been a very interesting journey so far. So, so you've, you've been in the place where uh, a, a bag of ramen noodles would have been a gourmet meal. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. I, I was in, um, it was, it was noodles and it was, you know, sandwiches. And, you know, I remember my friends and I, we would, my, we would go to, um, uh, Jack in the box between 12 and three in the morning when they had their sale, because they had, it was a dollar for two tacos and a drink. Oh my god. And gosh. so we would go there and we would get their nasty talk. I mean, it was, you know, I, I, I'm glad that I went through it, especially when I did, when it was only my sanity on the line. I didn't, I wasn't married at the time. I didn't, I, you know, we don't, we still don't have children, but I didn't have other people involved. But, yeah. um, but I, I never want to go through that again. No, no. And, and, you know, that's, that's the thing is, is it, it, I think, and it's not just entrepreneurs, by the way, it's, it's people that punch a, a, a clock too. Right. Absolutely. So you, you hit these, these places in life and a lot of people, um, I've seen it. I mean, I'm, I'm a little bit older than you. I'll, I'll be 51 here in a, in a week or two. Um, Congrats. but, but you know, like I've seen it where, you know, people will hit these 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 walls in life and they stay stuck they literally yeah. keep telling themselves that same tragic story over and over and over and can never get past it and never go on to to build any kind of an empire to, to yes. you know as as elena cardone would say and and mm -hmm. they so they stay stuck there what is yes. it that you think um gives you the um, ability or the tenacity or whatever it is that that you don't stay stuck because that's the thing man I, I and this is one I'm you know I teach social media I teach people how to use social media properly right and companies right, right. and and right. but I I I always warn people look you if if Evan Stewart takes a picture in front of a Ferrari, well, that's a snapshot of one moment a day. It may be his, sure. it may not be his, it, but it's <laughs> just like a moment in time. It's not yes. like, so don't compare your movie to someone else's highlight reel, right? So, yes. so like, what is it that gives you the ability to not stay stuck in the crap? Because we all experience it. Well, you actually referenced something which I think is key, which is that whole picture in front of the Ferrari mentality. There are a couple of different components. The first one is I fundamentally could give a flying crap what people think about me. And that's not to be rude. It's just that my ego is not in your perceptions of my actions and Love my that. identity is not in your perceptions of my actions. I don't – I used to have a really, really big ego and I don't anymore, which means that if I lose everything – I mean, I, mean I, I speak from a external – perception you know do i care about that yeah obviously i've built something for a reason i don't want to lose it but right, right if i lose everything do i really care no it's not a my identity is so grounded in this reality that if that changes i lose my focus on who i am and that's the first thing is i literally can take everything to zero and i'll still be okay and that allows me to be flexible and to move extremely quickly because when things start going down it's okay now we need to adjust and it's not the emotions of, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. No, 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 it is, I'm getting an intense level of feedback right now. So let's 
let's move. It's, it's just, you, you need to have an effortlessness about like just a little dance, right? We're just moving, we're just moving, we're just flowing. And so I think so many people get caught in the trappings of their overflow and forget the cycle that got them there. Yeah. And the ego of, of, you know, a lot of people are operating in the, I need to prove something where they're actually a college kid that nobody believed in that that's a 50 year old person and said a college kid that no one believed in and I still have to prove something. Right. And that, when you don't lose that, that creates significant inflexibility. Um, but then the other thing is, you know, when you're talking about getting back up, I have personal, moral, and ethical alignment, points of accountability that keep me moving, right? My number one principle is commit first, figure it out later. I don't know if you can see on my, um, on my phone here, I've literally got my principles on the back of my phone. And uh, that, uh, just as a daily reminder when I pull it up, you know, but commit first, figure it out later is one of them. So I'll give you an example. This year is the first year that I'm really publicly putting out my coaching and my consulting and whatnot. I've been doing it privately for a while, but this is the first year, okay, I need to help other people live a life in, in significance instead of default. Yep. And so, and I've got the podcast and I've got the video content and I've got consulting and I'm traveling and off and getting that right stuff. I've got the conference coming up. I mean, it is a very, very, very hard work, hard financially year. Yeah. Um, and uh, I hit a couple of points this year where it was like, wow, this is getting really, really expensive. You know, where you hit this, your life gets okay and then it levels up and kind of kicks you in the butt a little bit. And um, and there was a point a couple of a couple of weeks back where I was looking at everything thinking, okay, something's, you know, we, we have to put more energy here. I mean, really just adjusting, adjusting, adjusting. And I got nervous. I really did. And I thought to myself, I, I could stop. But I can if I stopped right now, life would be great. You know? Yeah. I, I mean, things would be fine. But I don't want that. And so I was nervous. And then I realized, okay, commit first, figure it out later. So I'm at a point of stopping. So what do I do? Okay, money's going out the door, things are happening. You know what I did? I hired a salesperson. And I interviewed an administrative assistant. So in that tension, I'm going, I'm going to hire two more people. Commit <laughs> first, figure it out later, right? Yeah. And so, um, and then the, the I think that the movement, continual movement is important, regardless of what it is. Sometimes there are, the life around you is so fragile and falling apart. Sometimes the movement literally is physically, I'm going to take a breath and go to the gym today. Yeah. Things like that, just to keep you in motion. And then the last piece, I know this is kind of a long run around a short walk type of answer, but I think it's important. No, I love uh, it. The last piece is um, authenticity. You don't see me posing in front of a Lamborghini because I don't own a Lamborghini right. and I'm not full of crap. Right. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm transparent. I still drive a 2011 Hyundai Genesis. I could go and buy anything I wanted and I still drive a Genesis with 130,000 miles on it. Dude, because that is a that is a luxury car. Come on. Well, it is, but it's not a Rolls Royce. You know? <laughs> right. And um, um, and so I'm transparent about where I'm at, about the transition. And so I think one of the biggest catches when you stop is if you're authentic, uh, authentically putting out the right image of where you're at in life and your goal and your missions and all of that, then there's nothing for you to hide behind. You, you don't have to hide behind something. But right. when you're trying to be something you're not, right? then what happens is when you stop, the real error doesn't come in your life screeching to a halt for a moment. It comes in an inability for you to keep up the facade that you didn't really have to begin with. And that's where that effortlessness comes into play is you immediately eliminate a lot of that friction when regardless your message and your story and your ability to impact stems from where you are in this moment, not where you would like to be in five or 10 years from now. I mean, even Ken, look at your life. Five years ago, 10 years ago, you would want to be somewhere, but did you even end up there? There's no way to match that projection. It never happens that way. No. And, and you know, I, I, I think we're both, I, I'm, I'm friends with, with Grant Cardone. I, I, I think you are too. Um, and, and he's, you know, he talks about that, that, that he, at one point, his goal was he was going to have a helicopter. Yes. <laughs> and now, yes. now he's got a jet, like, you know, he's like, I never in a million years thought that it would end up here, you know? And, and that's yeah. the thing. I, so many things in, in my life at, in 50 years that I'm like, all right, when I'm, when, you know, somebody, and <clears throat> I'm not making fun in any way, but somebody said to me recently, 
that's just starting out in a business at 30 <clears throat> something years old. Yeah, my goal is to be retired at 52. And I'm like, I get that. I get that. I, I Hey, I hope you do it. I really do. But I, I'm 51 and I I have now no desire to, to retire ever. Like I, I, I can't I think, even think like that. You know, and when we talk about retiring, I think that what, what people are really saying is I want to reach a point in my life where I stop sacrificing the things that are most important yes. to me for the things that are the least important to me. Amen. Where, you know, when we talk about that work-life balance, you know, Rocky Garza talked about this on the, if, if your listeners and your viewers watch this, I, if you go to my podcast, The Obsessed Podcast, there's a live stream I did with the Obsessed Keynote speaker for the conference, Rocky Garza. And he's yeah. a profound man. One of the things that he talks about is his definition of work-life balance of the People, you know, you get tired of sacrificing what's most important for the things that are least important, but you still feel obligated to do them. And in that obligation, there's tension. And yeah. so I think when people say, I want to retire, it's I want a point in my life where I have to stop losing the time with the things that are most important to be spending it with the people that I don't care about and in the things that I don't care about. Right. And I think that's the difference is, you know, I'm sure there might have been a point in your life where you maybe thought about retirement. Or sure. oh, maybe one day I'd like to be, or something like that. Yeah. But now that you're there and you're living a life more in a obsession, that obsessed life of, I don't want this to end, and therefore retirement doesn't become an option. Now the work may change as you right. get older and whatnot, but ultimately the retirement usually doesn't become an option. I think those days are going to be become limited, especially for people like you, like a lot of your viewing audience who are really trying to chase an overarching vision that's greater than them and their life and their legacy yep. uh, in that it's pretty hard to stop running of your own accord. And that that's it, 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 it boils down to freedom. I want freedom yeah. to do what I want when <laughs> I want and have nobody on this planet tell me how I'm supposed to do it. And, and right. that all comes from the financial end. I think, you know, I, I see these minimalists that are living in the tiny houses and I'm like, man, I, I, I don't know, man. feels like you've given up. I don't know why, <laughs> but, but, you know, again, I'm not, I'm not yeah. judging, but I, I couldn't go there. I just couldn't do it, you know? Sure. Sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, you know, and I think it's important to know one thing that I really liked a uh, caveat, I, I will, you know, kind of an asterisk on the back of the conversation yeah. is that. I am not a believer that everyone is supposed to be a millionaire. And I used to be. Right. I used to be, well, if you don't want this, then you're just accepting failure. I mean, I used to have that harsh line. I don't believe yeah. that anymore. I believe that building that life you can be obsessed about, living in giftedness, it is that, like you said, freedom and that you are working in to the best capacity whatever you feel called to do. Right. Like I know there's a person in my life who's going to be, uh, who's called to be a school teacher. And she's never going to be a multi, 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 multi millionaire, yeah. but she is going deep into how she can impact in the micro in order for that eventually to overflow into a macro impact. And I consider her to still be living in her giftedness and in her obsession because her entire life is focused around being the best she can be in that space. And, um, you know, I think that defining your freedom is the first step to that. Like you talk about, well, maybe tiny houses isn't for you. It's not really for me either. But but then on the other side of that is what's the definition of that freedom? And then we right. reverse engineer that life. And, and that gives us a path to, to to what that looks like. Yeah. Yeah. And, and again, I, I, I'm with you. I totally agree. Totally agree mm -hmm. with you. Not everybody's supposed to be a millionaire. And, yeah. and I mean, dude, if everybody was supposed to be a millionaire, who in the world would would like there? You'd pull up to a drive-through at at Jack in the Box, and nobody'd be there. <laughs> exactly. Well, and it's like that. I mean, the same concept goes around college education, right? I mean, there are companies now that are they they don't even care about degrees anymore. I mean, there are companies. I mean, think about it, Ken. When you're going through the school system, if I were to say you can make hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars a year, and no one would even ask you about a college degree, you would literally laugh me, you know, out and think I'm crazy. I mean, even. 20 years ago. That's in the true. University. And and nowadays, I mean, there are companies that literally don't even care because it's becoming so plentiful that the value is just diminishing. I mean, we hear now, if you don't have a master's and really even a doctorate, it's not even worth going to school. And that's a right. crazy reality because it means that now, instead of sacrificing three and four years and 60 to $80,000, I'm sacrificing 
six to eight years and hundreds of thousands of dollars. Yeah. And, um, you know, the same thing comes down financially, right? It's where if everybody's living on the same plane, then it doesn't become special anymore. You know, I, 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 um, I, I've mentioned this many times on my show, but you know, I, I was told in the 12th grade after taking a lot of college prep courses and acing algebra, trig, analytic geometry, all I loved math, but I, I hated biology. And, and they called me in and they said, hey, um, this is a few months before graduation. You didn't sure. get a biology credit in the 10th grade and you need that to graduate. And I'm like, why? I'm ne I'm never dissecting a frog again. I hated that class. Right. And and so, you know, I argued for, a few, and then I'm like, you know what, fine, whatever. And I walked out and I never graduated. I never got a GED, but I have had thousands of college graduates work for me. And exactly. and so, you know, I, I, I truly believe that it comes down to what you were talking about, you know, First off, I, I'm not sure, and again, I have had it shift many times in life where you think you're on the purpose, you think you're on your purpose, like this is it, right. I'm gonna right. change the world, and then something happens and you have to change directions or go down a different path, and it's like, right. you know, sure. so, so I believe that your purpose changes and it, it'll change many times in life, um, but, when you have that goal, that purpose, that major mm -hmm. defining moment where you're like, okay, this is, this is what I'm going after with everything. Then sleep no longer matters as much. And, and you just have this, this, this drive, this thing that will, the, what your hat says, you become obsessed. Well, and that's my whole concept of obsession, you know, and you said that one defining moment, the obsession that I teach is not, the you know you know kind of camera up like oh it's the gym and it's five in the morning and i hate being here but i'm here no no <laughs> it's more i believe that obsession starts with revelation and it's to get so caught with the cause that you become evangelical about a purpose and you baptize your world in that mission i believe that obsession is a mindset obsession is a discipline i believe that obsession excuse me is an emotion a mindset and a discipline in that order yeah. i believe that there's a specific cycle that garnishes an ability for the cycle leads to overflow, which is the saturation of abundance from your ability to work in alignment with your gifts. And what you talk about is there becomes that moment of revelation. When you are caught in a cause, I believe you're living in obsession when you lose the obligation. Yeah. When it's no longer, I am obligated to do this, but it's now you and your gift become so deeply intertwined. You and that cause become so deeply intertwined. The yoking of you both, it becomes impossible to untangle. And that really is the most people live in the emotion. And that's the hard part is because it's fleeting. And when the emotion, the, the minute that you get that moment of revelation, it starts to diffuse. It starts to dissipate, yeah. which means that your conviction in that moment, if you don't move with it, will dissipate with it. And that's why you get all of these people that get excited and they get into something and they start and then they never move on. Yep. And then they start and they never move on. I'm going to eat healthy. Nope. I'm going to go to the gym. Nope. I'm going to make a million dollars. Nope. And then three months, six months, even you're still where they used to be. I say, if you can still recognize the person you were a year ago, you're not moving fast enough. Yep. You know, and then so that that entire concept focuses around the how do we live a life that's inspiring, fascinating, and motivating to where we can get up every single day and feel so called to our purpose that just by opening our eyes and our excitement of having the blessing of another day it is enough for us to put our feet on the ground and move forward with excitement, diligence, to have clarity, confidence, and conviction in our daily actions. You know, getting to that point. Very few people do it with enough diligence that they actually reach it. And that's why people that are truly living obsessed lives that really flip that switch are put on this pedestal like, oh my gosh, how did they do it? Well, I tell you how they did it. They actually put an obedience in a specific direction towards that focus. Yep. You know, it doesn't happen just because I'm sitting in my room one day and all of a sudden the sky opens up and I get zapped with an idea. That's not how it happens at all. Dude, that's what... <laughs> <laughs> that's so funny. Uh, that's what I think that's what everybody's waiting on. <laughs> yeah, I really do. Like, Hey, the, uh, who was it? Uh, it wasn't Moses that saw the burning bush, but whoever it was like, like, you know, yeah. like they're waiting on the burning bush. They're waiting on the clouds to part and God to come down and say, 
You know, and I saw, I don't know if you ever saw the movie The Secret, but Neil Donald Walsh is one of my favorite people in the world. And he talks about that. He's like, you know, it's not like there's this chalkboard where, where you know, God wrote, you know, Evan C. Stewart was born and his purpose is blank. Right. I, I, I think that we we have to take our unique gifts and talents and, and apply those and... I, I, this whole purpose thing, man, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm not really, I don't know if it's really something that like, Hey, Evan, your purpose is to go out and make millions of dollars a year doing real estate deals. And, and yeah. you know, and mine is, and Ken walls is supposed to be developing websites and coaching and making millions to change the No, I don't think that that's it. I think that you, you find something you can feel really, really passionate about. And you mentioned something a minute ago, and that's the emotion. There, there's mm -hmm. got to be, right, that some kind of an emotion that's driving the whole thing. Right, right. Well, and, you know, what, like you talk about, I believe that, you know, when we talk about this concept of purpose, purpose is for someone else, not for you. Right. And that's that's the first thing, is that, when you think that your purpose is to make millions of dollars and do so, that's not a purpose. That's because you want an excuse to be able to be selfish. Yeah. The real purpose is for other people and in your ability to impact other people. I mean, we're friends with the Ziegler family, right? Yeah. Zig's thing was you, your life, you can get everything you want in life by helping other people get enough other people get what they want. Right. And, yep. you know, your income is a reflection of your level of impact for other people. And so, you know, you touched on a couple of really, really important points there, but ultimately I believe that if you've got somebody who's viewing this, it's really just kind of wondering where they start. That's considering, you know, this whole concept of obsession and, and it's so saturated right now, this market, because we were on this great, like self discovery of, you know, people realizing that maybe sitting in a cubicle for 60 years of their life is not the most exciting thing. And right. I think really that looking back at your life there, we have this moment of, of revelation and revelation is not this massive moment usually revelation is something that hits you deeply but it's usually delivered in a in a, a a seemingly kind of overlookable type of way right if you someone could say something something could happen it's not always this big thing sometimes my biggest moments of revelation have been small moments where something has something small happens and it just hits me like, like that yeah and i just kicked back like internally but you know, we've got the stage of emotion, and I talked about this at the conference, so if someone really wants to go deep into this, they can definitely come to the conference and get this whole keynote, but, you know, when we're working with, with obsession, we've got the, the emotion, which is a stage of revelation, and then we've got the mindset, which is a stage of preparation, and then we've got the discipline, which is a stage of cultivation, and that leads to overflow, which is saturation, and we start with this moment of revelation, and then we, we prepare the law of the harvest, right? We get everything ready, and then we, we work our land, and we're obedient for a long time, long time, years, decades, obedient, and then we lead into overflow. Um, I think that once we have that moment, that defining factor, we can look back on and say, this thing changed my life. Where people lose is taking that moment and cultivating it and growing it and allowing it to, to, to build and build and build it's just like a plant, just because you bring a plant into your home doesn't mean it's literally spent on working that ground and preparing yeah. and, and in that systematic preparation, most people get lost along the way. Yeah, yeah. Were you at the um, 10X Growth Conference last year? No, not last year. <clears throat> Steve Harvey, year, Steve Harvey, you know, who's worth, I don't know, 150 million or so. Um, yeah, yeah. when, when he spoke, he talked about some of the same stuff and he talked about also mm -hmm. living in his car for three years or three and a half years. And it's like, dude, like what? Like, that's crazy. And, and I, so again, there's an example of somebody that, and he talks about purpose. He talks about that in, in his speech there. Um, but I, I think that Again, most people go to the place of um, getting they they get stuck. They hit that that barrier that that they get stuck in. Um, 
you know they 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 go out <laughs> they go out and grab a couch next to the dumpster and think this is it this is my life forever i'm going to be using dumpster yeah. furniture from this point and they end up staying stuck there for life and and yeah. you know i hate that i hate that because it's not it's absolutely not necessary let me ask you this what do you think in your opinion what is the number one thing and this is just your opinion that stops mm -hmm. most people from experiencing and not just financial but financial um and every other level of success that there is what do you think stops most people keeps them stuck discomfort they are more fearful of the discomfort than they are of living a life of mediocrity you see what really drives me is i am so i, I have this thought right if i go out right now and I get hit by a truck. Who's going to remember my name for what and for how long? That is not a close friend, a family, a relative, my wife. And I am more fearful of an inability for me to change the trajectory and the power of my family's name through my actions than I am of the discomfort of that process, which means that when we, you know, touched on earlier, taking everything to zero, losing the ego, all of that, all of that is shed because my number one point of discomfort is insignificance, mediocrity, complacency. But on the other side of that coin, complacency and mediocrity feels really good. Well, it doesn't really, it doesn't feel really good. It doesn't feel like crap. And that's the problem is that people forget the discomfort is that I used to say it's a good life. Like, ah, oh, Ken, it's a good life. But I stopped saying it's a good life because that was in my mind recognizing that I'm living the good life. It means along the way I sacrifice the great life. And a lot of people stop at good. Because good means that you can take a family trip or two a year. It means that you got a decent home. You got a decent school district. You've got, you know, things are fine. And we're constantly taught that when things are fine, it really becomes selfish to want more. No, I believe that you should always pursue more, not because you're selfish, not because you're trying to be greedy, but because it is your responsibility for the people that are looking for you to give them the best version of yourself and the most that you can possibly give. How can you give someone the most when you can barely provide the most for yourself and for the people that are important to you? And so I believe that discomfort is the number one reason why, because people are scared to start. What will they think? What will happen to my finances? What will they, and I know a lot of that's real. A lot of that is real. You got yeah. kids, I'm sorry. You gotta have some money in the bank because kids gotta eat. Like a lot of it is real, but at some point people stop looking for new opportunities because they're caught in that web of excuses. And then that's when you live your life and you get to your deathbed and it's always, I wish I, or back when I, I mean, think about it. I know people in my life that are in their sixties and their seventies still talking about their high school baseball days. Like, man, do you realize that the high school you were in nowadays? I mean, I mean, it's, it's the world is so different now but their entire life, whenever we talk, there's always going to be a story about high school baseball or college baseball. There's always going to be the story of back when, which it's one thing to recognize and appreciate what you've done. It's another thing to live a life so complacent and mediocre that by the time you're at the end of your life, the only thing you can speak to is one time at the very beginning of your life when something went right. Yeah. And I think that that's just a terrible waste of the gift we've been given. Dude, that, yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a sucky, that's, that would suck. I mean, that yeah. would be terrible. That'd be terrible. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and people go through it. People, that actually happens more than it doesn't. Oh, sure. Absolutely. Well, and that's why I'm doing what I'm doing. Because I believe it's my moral and my ethical responsibility to the world. If I can help other people change the trajectory of their life by living in giftedness instead of living by default, it becomes my moral and my ethical responsibility to do so. So I most love people are living there, but it's it's just once you once you've just glimpsed this other life. See, I, I believe in there are moments where we can glimpse our better future. And when our, our vision goes back to now, we can never look at that thing the same again. Right. That, that could be a moment of revelation yeah. where your perspective changes so drastically and so quickly that immediately you cannot look at your same reality again. Yeah. But we have to be willing to look. And there are a lot of times where we've got this massive screaming something over here just saying, just breathe and look and observe what you can have. Yeah. Oh, from here to here is eight to 10 years of just not good. 
And I would rather have 60 years of fine than eight years of really tight hardship for 50 years of unbelievable world-changing significance. That gap is really hard to bridge. Yeah. And, and, and you know, it's, um, I, I'll tell you, I've had, I've had this happen personally in my, my journey of, of being an entrepreneur. Um, I've experienced mm -hmm. unbelievable success, millions and millions of dollars. And mm -hmm. I've experienced tens of dollars. <laughs> like yeah. I've been through it all. And, 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 you know, I, I'll tell you, I've had one day I had somebody, an employee come in and go, Hey, um, there's some dude looking in the windows of your SUV out in the parking lot. And I'm like, well, tell him to get the heck out of here. And he's like, well, I would, but he's got a tow mm -hmm. truck. Mm -hmm. He's got a tow truck blocking it. <laughs> and I'm like, what and and so that was a are, are you still there i think this this thing's yeah, acting uh -huh. it's acting wonky your 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 video is frozen um no, so, I'm right here. so so you know i said and it was he was there to repossess my car and, in front of all my employees and that was a horrible horrible day for the person that is um maybe going through it right now at this moment, maybe they're listening to this and, and, and their car got repoed last week. They're getting evicted tomorrow. They're they're They can't feed their family. They've tried everything in their mind. Um, mm -hmm. you know, empathy is something that, that, um, I, I'm, I'm pretty good at because I've been through it, you know, so I, sure. I can sure. understand it. Um, but, you know, they're just at that place and they were to call you up and say, Evan, I'm stuck, man. I don't know what to do. I really, truly don't. I've tried everything and nothing's working out. What do you say to them in that moment? Because I've been there where I had to call somebody, swallow all my pride and say, hey, um, geez, you know, I can't I can't feed my kids like and mm -hmm. and of course, you get the lecture of, well, you shouldn't be an entrepreneur. You shouldn't be, you know, all of that. But what do you say to that person that's really, really giving it a go and they're not making it and help them get, because it's up here. We know that, it, right? It is. But I think the first thing is, is continual movement. Like we talked about of you, you cannot stop every single day you need to be in movement and you can be where the rest of you know your car is getting repossessed and there's problems at the house and you've got re you know and where sometimes literally the only thing you can move is your physical presence and go to the gym and work out and, and go for a walk and get some headspace i mean literally as simple as it sounds sometimes one of the best things you can do is breathe and literally physically disconnect yeah but something that i think is important is if there's a listener that's going through that type of hardship you could be an amazing accomplished person and just be in the wrong vehicle where just because you started this company and you had this idea doesn't mean that that is where you should be. And there are some times where if you just looked at your life and transitioned to another vehicle, I'm not saying if you're facing hardship to quit. I'm not saying if the job isn't going right to shut it down. I'm saying, have a really honest conversation with yourself and look at your life and think, okay, if I, I mean, it, if I have been hitting this roadblock and hitting this roadblock and hitting this roadblock and not making momentum and, and it's just years and, and 10 and 15 and 20 years of this type of hardship, you very well could be in the wrong vehicle. And so the very first thing I would say is we have to start movement, physical and mental movement in my hardest times of my life. I forced myself to be continually in the word in my relationship with Christ. I forced myself to continually be in podcasting and in motivation and in, in education, even when I didn't want to be, when I just wanted to do something different. I yeah. forced myself to get up and get moving and get in the gym. And those little things kept me moving because I, I was able to continue my momentum. And then the other the other side of that was I, you know, really objectively looked and thought, okay, is this the vertical I really need to be in right now? Right. And and it might be yes for a moment and no for the entirety of your career and your life. But, um, you know, I think that level of objectivity of, of self insight is massive, especially when you're faced with those moments of extreme discomfort. Wow. Dude, so much wisdom. You're, you're like this really old soul. Where did you, 
Where did you learn all this man. stuff? That's awesome. <laughs> just being attentive, Ken. Just being attentive. I I love it, dude. I love it. Mm. Well, man, that um, that that brings us. Uh, I don't know what happened with Facebook, but we literally have had zero people watching. But um, it, it'll that's go, all right. It'll go we'll, out. We'll post the replay and yeah, and, and they can get a chance to rewatch it. Yeah, I don't know what happened. It happens every blue moon, but but uh, it's weird, but. Um, anyway, so Evan, I, you know, how can, first off, before I wrap up, let's talk about what you have going on now and how people can follow you and, Mm -hmm. and any, any special offers you may have for people. Absolutely. You're you're awesome, man. I appreciate that. And so are you. Um, I, uh, I'm obsessed conference, which is probably the most important event that you can attend this year. The Obsessed Conference really focuses on points of action over motivation on, you've got people that have built multi-hundred million dollar businesses, the nation's top coaches and thought leaders to challenge you and sales professionals. What are the points of action that you can immediately implement that they use to get to their level that you can use to rise to the occasion in your own life? And that's gonna be July 25th. For your listening and viewing audience, if they use code EVAN, E-V-A-N 19, It'll get you my special friends and family discount, but you need to commit to your seat because we will sell out. So if you go to obsessedconference.com, you can personally get a seat, I believe, in exposure over immersion. I believe when you want to commit to something fully in that way, it can drastically change your life. And I've specifically built this event to be a life-changing point of recognition for the attendees. So I'm sticking my name, my reputation on credible. I don't do anything half-assed, and so I really, really, really believe that if your audience wants to level up, that's where they need to go. So as far as the big thing, that is the big thing right now. Um, Other than that, you can find me on social. I'm super active on Instagram. My user is on everything is at real Evan Stewart, and that's Stewart with an E-W-A-R-T. And um, other than that, you know, my DMs are open. I'm always open to having conversations, starting conversations, connecting with people. Uh, If you shoot me a message, I'm more than happy to sit down with you for some personal time at the conference you know again accessibility over inaccessibility is an important principle of mine and um yeah just i if, if you guys have appreciated this content i just ask that you continue to support ken and and get this message out to people that need to hear it i think it's our responsibility once we've heard something great to share it with the world so i'm just really glad that we could be here this morning Ken. wow dude you you're uh i i love it i love what you're doing you're um I can't believe you're only in your 20s, man. You seem like you're like <laughs> 70. <laughs> uh, I, I feel I feel old. Trust me, all my friends are, are older, and and uh, or most of them, you know, I, I feel I feel old, but uh, well, yeah, that's okay. <laughs> wow. So, well, dude, thank you so much. Appreciate you taking the time to come on today. Um, hopefully, this thing recorded for me, and and I can because I the Facebook video is not working, so. I'm gonna have to. That. I'm gonna have to delete it and upload this. But um, hey, look, this is awesome. This has been great content. Everybody watching this, make sure that you're following Evan Stewart on Facebook, on Instagram, everywhere, and and take him up on that offer if you can get to Dallas. It's in Dallas, right? It's in Dallas. Yeah, super easy to fly into. Super yeah. inexpensive for hotels if they're from out of town. I mean, yeah. it's really it's. I mean, even between you and I, Ken, at the end of the whole thing, I'm, I'm actually going to be still in the hole, like tens of thousands of dollars. This yeah. entire event is literally just to give back. So that's eliminating awesome. all excuses and making it happen. Dude, that's awesome. That's awesome. Well, man, I appreciate you. I appreciate you coming on today. And and let's do it again, man. Let's, let's, uh, let's get you on here in the next six months or so and see how things are going for you. Let's do it. Thank you for your awesome. time, Ken. I appreciate Thanks it. Thanks for being on. Thank you all for watching this. Have an amazing day. Make it an amazing life, and we will see you tomorrow. Have a great day. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Evan. Thanks.